Yes, good day. My name is Reginald and I'm the tutor for professional and community development. Welcome to all of you attending this session. We'll start off by going through the units one by one. As you know, there are seven units. So we'll start off with the first unit, which is titled Issues of the Teaching Profession and Professionalism. Um, so basically what we're going to look at within this unit is what is professional and what is community development? What is it all about? Why this subject of professional and community development? So why teach a subject or a module with professional and community development? One of the reasons is that teaching is a specialized profession and it is important that you learn from the beginning what is expected of you as a teacher not only to know the methods of teaching, but what are the other expectations that your organization will have of you as a teacher. Teaching is more than a profession. Some might call it a calling. So you therefore need to be aware of the importance of the career that you have chosen. Why is being a teacher so important? What role do teachers play in building the nation? What is it as a teacher that gives you a sense of accomplishment, a sense that you are, you are contributing to the welfare and the well-being of the Namibian nation. You need to work diligently towards your career goals as a teacher. It doesn't only end when you get your, your diploma or your degree, but it goes beyond that. As a teacher, you are also a leader and a part of the learner in your class. And apart from your learner in the class, you also have to influence the parents as well as the community at large. So if you don't see yourself as a community leader, as a teacher, then you limit your scope of influence. You will therefore learn in this, in this unit how to contribute towards developing the community in which you live or work. Lastly, teachers should never stop learning, as it was said, and developing their skills. Teaching does not end when you get your diploma or degree. You have to go further than that to make sure that you are up to date with the latest information and there are new developments within the teaching field, new methods of teaching that will enhance your teaching and make you more um, successful. So you always have to learn. You have to enroll yourself for courses over the years until the age that you retire. And even if you wish, beyond retirement, you can still act as a teacher in different fields. Moving on, we will look at the terminologies profession and professionalism. What is a profession? What is, be, uh, what is uh, being referred to as professional? The words profession and professional come from the Latin word professio, which means a public declaration with a force or a promise. So when you choose the profession of a teacher, you are making a public declaration. You are telling the public, listen, this is what I've chosen, this is what I do. So it's a public declaration with a promise. That means when you become a teacher, your career comes with promises attached, that you render service, that you contribute to nation building. So when you choose the career of teaching, it's not only about you. It's also about the role you play in the community. So the words profession and professional come from, even the word professionalism, come from the, the Latin word professio, which means a public declaration with a promise. So what is a profession? There are many professions, teaching being one of them, being a doctor, a social worker, a nurse, a pilot, a marine biologist. So what is a profession? A profession can be defined as a special type of occupation. So it is an occupation. More than that, it comprises of an elite group. Why are this called, group called an elite? Elite means very special, set apart, very important. So what does it mean that it comprises of an elite group? It comprises of an elite group because these people that belong to this certain profession qualified to be part of this profession. So not anyone can walk from the street and say, oh, I'm a teacher. You need to be qualified to a certain profession or an occupation. So first of all, it is an occupation. 
comprising of an elite group with special power and prestige in which the members declare in a public way that they promise to act or behave in a certain way. So let's take this definition apart. We've already explained that it's a special type of occupation. That means you have certain skills that set you apart from other professions. So for example, being a teacher, what type of skills do you have in your occupation? What does your occupation do? It teaches. It passed down knowledge from one generation to the other. That's your role in society, to pass down knowledge from one generation to the other and to shape the minds of the coming generation and those that want to attain skills, new skills. So it is a special type of occupation. Not anyone can claim that they are teachers. It is a special type of occupation. It comprises of an elite group. We have explained that you are special because you have qualified, you have met the requirements for being a teacher. So you belong to an elite group, a special group, a very important group. And then with special power and prestige, it means because of your role, because of your qualification, because of your job as a teacher, you have certain powers. In fact, the Education Act says that when you are a teacher, you act as a parent for those learners while they are on the school premises and during the school hours. So that's the power that you've been given. You've been given the power to pass down the knowledge and the skills that you have to the new generation. And which other profession has that power given to them to pass down knowledge as your first mandate? So teachers are a special elite group of people. So you have special power and then you also have prestige. Being a teacher brings you honor. It brings you influence. The, by virtue of you being a teacher in the community, you have fame. The people in the community, they know you and they respect you as a teacher. You have prestige. You carry a title with you. And then as, because you have, you have passed your qualification as a teacher, you are known as a teacher, this a membership, you now belong to the membership of the teachers, the teachers club. You declare in a public way that you promise to act in a certain way. So because teaching is a profession, they have code of conduct. You cannot just behave any way you want. So the minute you enter into the teaching profession, it comes with responsibilities. So when you become a teacher, when you qualify, when they, they put that garment on you, when you qualify and they give you that bouquet of flowers when you qualify, when you graduate, what does that mean? That you take on the mantle, you are taking on the cloak of responsibility. So you promise by virtue of that qualification to act and behave in a certain way that brings honor to your profession. So sometimes teachers think that, um, people think because I, I belong to a teacher, I work eight to five, then after I knock off, I can get drunk in the street, I can do whatever I want. It's not true. You bring dishonor to your profession because people will attach your behavior to your profession and say, ah, teachers are like that, teachers are like this, ah, they are not good people. Why? Because of the behaviors of certain members of our profession, we lose respect. So when you qualify to be a teacher, you have the responsibility to honor the profession because by virtue of that qualification, you have promised to act and behave in a certain way that brings honor to the profession. And this is why we have codes of conduct. So a profession is regulated by a regulating body. So if you misbehave, there is a body that will come after you to discipline you. So a, any profession is regulated by a regulating body to make sure that its members act according to the promise that they declared in the, in the public. The regulating body may discipline you, may discipline any person who misbehaves or does not follow the code of conduct or brings shame to the profession. Members of the profession claim a fee for their work. Because you belong to an occupation, you get a fee. You are hired by an organization, whether the Ministry of Education or by a private company where you do workshops or whatever or job you do. But you do claim a fee for your work because you have a certain skill and you offer a service to the community. And with that service comes payment. 
A profession, as one stated, offers a service to the community. And this is why you belong to an elite group. You have an occupation because you have a special skill that, you, that only belongs to your profession where you say, this is what we do as teachers. This is the service that we offer to the community. And because of this, the community accepts the profession and expects it to serve an important social goal. So this is why becoming a teacher is not just about you as a teacher. It's also about the contribution that you make to the nation, to your community, and the minds that you'll be shaping, the future generation that you'll be shaping. So there are certain expectations of you as a teacher that goes beyond the teaching methods. An occupation, like we said, usually involves training and qualifications. No one can just come off the street and claim to be a teacher you must have a qualification. You must have met certain criteria to belong to this elite group of professions. There is an expectation for higher standards and excellence. So it's not enough that you just obtain your degree or your diploma. You must constantly improve yourself. You must constantly show that your service is still uh, needed, it's still relevant, and that you can keep up with new developments. When there are new developments, you should keep up and say, how can our profession contribute to nation building? So there's an expectation for high standards and excellence that you deliver the best service as a teacher. The profession operates under a code of ethical standards. Like you say, there are code of conduct. You cannot just do as you please. Otherwise, the regulating body will discipline you. And that is a given for the profession. And that is to make sure that the profession renders quality service. It must discipline its members who don't follow the standards of the profession. So it, it, it operates under a code of ethical standards. There are rights and wrongs in the profession. For example, code of dressing. As a teacher, you cannot just dress anyhow in any way you want. You must follow the code of uh, dressing for teachers. You must look profession, professional, you must look neat, well-groomed. Um, the, the, these ethical standards are set by members of the profession. So it's not something that it's imposed on you. It is set by your superiors, people that have come before you, the pioneers in that profession. They have set the standard and said, this is how as teachers we act. We don't do this and this and that. This is how we act. And so... Members who join this profession that has set standards are held accountable. You are held accountable for your actions. And this is why they, they have regulating bodies, to hold members accountable for their actions. The standards are stipulated, they are implemented, and they are enforced by the regulating body. So what is professionalism? We spoke about profession. What is a profession? It's an occupation with an elite group, with special powers and prestige. And members declare in the public that they will promise to deliver this and that service, and they have a regulating body. So what is the word professionalism? What does it refer to? Professionalism means a profession, professional person. That means a person with an occupation. For example, a teacher works in a profession. That means you as a professional work in a profession in a professional manner. So how do you simplify this sentence? It simply means that your conduct and behavior and that you have the competence and qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. So like we said, yes, you get the qualification. And yes, you will be called a teacher, but it's more than just the qualification. It's also your behavior that follows, your conduct. That's what makes you a professional. And that is what we refer to as professionalism. Your conduct that is in line with the set standards of your profession. That's what we call professionalism. So it refers to your behavior, your manners, your way of thinking, the way you respect your profession and those that you serve. That's what we refer to as professionalism. So what are the expectations of a professional in a profession? 
as a teacher, you are now a professional because you have declared in a public, uh, uh, in a public that you will adhere to certain codes of conduct, that you act a certain way, that you uplift and not shame your profession. So what are the expectations of you as a teacher? You've gotten your degree, so what is expected of you? First of all, a high degree of systematic knowledge. This is what I always say. You must prove that you went to school for the number of years that you went, and you prove this by the way you carry out your work. It must be professional. You must follow the methods of that profession, the teaching methods. The way of conducting yourself must be based on knowledge, scientific knowledge. You cannot just decide, I want to do things like this and like that. First, you must look at what are the knowledge and the methods in my profession that are used. Otherwise, anyone from the street can claim, can claim to be a teacher. So there's a high degree of systematic knowledge expected from that teacher. That for the number of years you went to school, you have gained knowledge that is expected of your profession and that you can display and demonstrate that you have this knowledge. So you must have this systematic knowledge. Systematic is just another word for method, methodical. It's scientific. There are ways of doing things within the teaching profession, and this is why you go to school for the number of years, to learn these ways, to learn this knowledge. So you must be able, when you go back into the teaching field, to demonstrate that you've gone to school and you've mastered the methods of the teaching profession. Secondly, you must have a strong community orientation and loyalty. This refers to the service. Many a times, if we are not careful, we can bring our community, uh, our profession into disrepute, where people doubt our profession and say, ah, this profession, what kind of people are these? You know, the community is judging us. So we must have a strong community orientation. We must work together with the community and we must be loyal to the community because we have declared and made a promise that as teachers, this is the service we are going to give. That means we must be loyal to that promise. You cannot become a teacher and students are failing and you are not bothered. You must ask yourself, why are my students not, not passing? Because then you are not being loyal. If you are teaching students and they are failing, you have not kept the promise of passing knowledge from one generation to the other. So you must be loyal. And how do you demonstrate your loyalty? By giving the best service possible by fulfilling that promise that you made the minute you declared a teacher. Thirdly, self-regulation, which is very, very important. Don't wait for someone to run after you and say, do this, don't do that. You must be self-disciplined and you must be able to regulate yourself. Because you've gone to school for the number of years, we trust when you are given that qualification, we trust that you can regulate yourself. You can be your own boss. If your students are not passing, if your learners are not passing, you will be able to say, okay, let me change my method of teaching. Let me investigate like this and like that. That is what we refer to self-regulation. You must be able to get yourself into a situation and decide which is the best um, action to take in this situation because you are self-regulated. You understand the standards of the profession, therefore you can boss yourself. You can discipline yourself and you can act accordingly. Fourthly, you must have the skills and competency based on abstract knowledge. And this is tied in with the first one, that you must have a high degree of systematic knowledge. So this, the first one and the fourth one are basically the same. You must demonstrate competency when you get into the field. People should be able to see that you understand the theories that you were taught in school and that you can apply them and contextualize them to the community where you find yourself teaching. Because teachers will go to the same schools of training. They will get the same training, but they will not work in the same environment. So with the theoretical knowledge, you are armed to tackle any situation that you find yourself, be it rural, be it urban, 
be it a highly technological society or a very not so technological society. You must be able to cope and adapt to that environment as a teacher. Why? Because you have the theoretical knowledge and background. And with theory, you can adapt that knowledge to any context. So you must have skills and competency based on abstract or theoretical knowledge. And this you get throughout the years that you're studying. And this is very important to understand all the theories that you are being taught. Why? Because you will need these theories during your practice. When you are a teacher in the field, you will need your theories. Fifth, what is expected of a professional teacher in a profession of teaching is upholding an improvement of training and education. This is why we refer to lifelong learning. When you get your degree or your diploma, it doesn't end there. You must continually read and upgrade yourself. Keep up to date. What is the latest development within my profession? What are, teaching, uh, what are the universities teaching learners, the uh, student teachers these days? Find out. Hone your skills. Make sure that you are the best. Even if you graduated 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you must be the kind of teacher where the young teachers that are coming in the profession, they see you and they say, let me run to this teacher. She knows her work. I know the theory as a young teacher, but I don't know how to apply these things. And this is what teachers, older teachers, bring to the profession. They bring experience in how to apply the theories in practice. And this is what they can pass down to new teachers. Experience. So you must never, ever stop learning as a teacher. You must always improve your skills. Read magazines, read journals, go on the internet, find new information, always improve your skills. When you teach subjects, find out what is the best way to teach this topic to my learners that they understand it and they master it so that they can pass very well. So you must, what is expected is that upholding an improvement of training and education, your own uh, training and education. You must never stop learning. Formal organization, the organization, the, the teaching uh, profession is organized. It's an organized institution with standards, and you must adhere to that. You must recognize that you belong to a body with other members, an old profession that has knowledge and that has an important role to play in society. It's a formal organization. Um, Adherence to a code of conduct. Yes, there is the code of conduct. Why? Because not all of us who enter the profession will act accordingly or will know how to act accordingly. So the code of conduct is there to guide us. And when we do not act accordingly, the code of conduct is there to remind us during discipline, disciplinary hearings that this is the code of conduct you signed. This is what you promised to do. This is how you said you will conduct your, your, yourself. So why have you not conducted yourself in the same manner? So adherence to a code of conduct is very important in any profession. Altruistic services. Teaching is a calling. It is a service you give to the community. There is um, this word altruistic. It, it, it means selfless. That means you promote the well-being of other people. It's about community, it's about development. Teaching is a very important uh, profession because it is to do with the welfare and the well-being of other people, the coming generation especially. So it is a service that has a noble, noble calling to pass knowledge and wisdom to the new generation so that the human family can improve and develop and that people can live better lives. And education helps us to meet our goal as the human family. We pass knowledge to our young ones, and that's a very noble calling. So professional conduct expected of a professional teacher. You must have expert and specialized knowledge. Like we say, we can't stress enough the importance of mastering your theories and the knowledge that you get during training. You must understand the job. You must understand what the job entails and the theories that are used 
in the knowledge base, you must understand. Otherwise, what will you do in the profession when you get into the field? So there is an expectation that you master, you become an expert, and you have specialized knowledge. Specialized knowledge meaning knowledge that is unique to your profession. You must have excellent practical and literary skills relating to teaching. You must be able to stand in front of a class and be able to teach, to pass down knowledge to the next person, knowledge and skills to the next person. So it's not enough that you understand it for yourself. Can you transfer that knowledge to the next person? And this is where we talk about excellent practical and literary skills. You must be able to pass down the knowledge to the next person. And that is a skill of teaching. So it's not enough that you understand it. You must also have the skill to pass down this knowledge to the next person, that they understand it. A high quality work in all areas of teaching. Excellence. As a teacher, people must be able to look at you and say, wow, this is what teachers can do. It's not to say, ah, I can also become a teacher. I can also teach even though I didn't go to school. No. Because of the high quality of your work, people must respect your, t your, your training. But if you don't demonstrate high quality work, people will not respect your training. They're like, but where did this teacher study? So there's an expectation that a teacher must have high quality work, must produce quality work. You cannot teach 50 learners and only two pass. It says a lot about your quality of work. Yes, we can say the students don't study this, the learners are not serious, but you have to do introspection. Is my work of quality? Am I doing my best? Am I using all my skills and training that I got during my training years to produce high quality work? High standard of ethics. Ethics uh, 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 refer to right and wrong. So you must have high standard of ethics, behavior, and work activities while at the school and while teaching. You must act in a professional manner, professionalism. During school, uh, uh, during the time that you are in, uh, at, the, at the job, you cannot act anyway, gossip, talk about other teachers, mistreat learners, talk about parents. Those are not ethical behavior. So as a teacher, you must have a high standard of ethics, behavior, and work activities while at the school. You must act in a professional uh, manner, professionalism. That's what you must demonstrate. It is expected of teachers to sometimes put the interest of the learners, the parents, and the colleague or other members of the community before their own. Like we say, teaching is a noble calling. Where we, we worry about the, 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 the interest or the well-being of other people. So it is sometimes expected that the teacher must put in extra effort in order to meet your goals as a teacher. It's not to say, no, I'm not getting paid over time, so why should I help this learner? No, the learner say, miss, can you help me? I'm struggling with math. You cannot say, but who's going to pay me for the time that I'm going to spend with you? Sometimes teachers are required to go the extra mile. So a high standard of ethics, behavior, and work activities. Another expectation, uh, professional conduct expected of a professional teacher is a positive attitude towards a high workload and motivation to do a good job. We will never be paid enough for the work that we do. So we might as well do a good job of it, an excellent job of it. Sometimes we, we, we develop a negative attitude. Oh, I'm not paid enough money, so why should I do this and that? You should do it because it, it contributes to your sense of achievement and accomplishment. Because you've entered a profession where you have declared in a public way that you fulfill certain promises to learners and students. 
So it's very important to keep a positive attitude towards a high workload and motivation to do a good job in spite of what the situation tells us. Because yes, we'll find ourselves working in very poor conditions, in dirty classrooms, with undisciplined learners. You find yourself in all sorts of situations, but it's very important to always remember that you need a positive attitude. Otherwise, you will not cope with the teaching profession if you are negative, because you will encounter a lot of negative situations. You might feel unappreciated. You are doing your, 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 your level best, but you don't feel appreciated even by the principal or your other colleagues, or the parents are complaining, or the community is, doesn't understand the value of education. You will find yourself in a lot of situations that will test your resolve to be a teacher. The important thing to remember is to keep a positive attitude. You will not get enough reward in this lifetime for the work that you are going to do. Because the work is noble and it's very important. And sometimes we are just not paid enough. And we are not appreciated enough. But you have to keep that positive attitude. Another expectation, uh, uh, conduct that's expected of a teacher, is appropriate treatment of relationships within the teaching community. Relationship with learners, relationship with parents, relationship with your colleagues, relationships with your superiors, your principals and your HODs, and your senior teachers, you must learn to have good relationships with the people that you work with. Relationship with the community at large. As a teacher, you are a person of influence. So it's very important that you develop relationships that will help you in your teaching. Yes, teaching comes with a lot of prestige. It comes with a lot of respect. But then you are also expected to give that same respect to the learners, to the, teach, to the other colleagues, to parents, and to the community as a whole, and to your superiors. So you must learn to have good relationships with anyone that you come in contact with. Lastly, you must treat information about learners, parents, and other members of the community with confidentiality. Gossip is not allowed in the teaching profession. And you must have the wisdom to know what to share and what not to share. You will be entrusted with confidential information. Parents will tell you secrets. Your learners will tell you secrets. Your other colleagues will tell you secrets. Your principal will entrust you with information that is sensitive. How do you handle this information is a test of your maturity as a teacher and your professionalism. So it's very important that we learn to treat information with sensitivity, with confidentiality. Parents will come to us and tell us things about their families. Information, if, if given to other people, can be damaging. So how we handle this information is also a test of our professionalism. Parents cannot tell you something at school and then you go home and you tell your cousins. Do you know that Auntie Hu Hu is doing this and that? No. That is us betraying our profession. So we must keep information confidential. So what are the profession uh, uh, attitudes towards teaching? What is expected of a teacher towards teaching when it comes to attitudes? What type of attitude should you have as a profession towards your teaching? The way you think about teaching has an influence on the way in which you will teach. If you think teaching was just a means for you to earn a salary, it will be reflected in your teaching methods in the way you handle learners and other colleagues. So your attitude is very important. If you think, no, teaching is a noble calling, I'm here to do an important work, I'm here to shape the minds of the future generation, 
I'm here to pass down skills, then you will teach in that way, with interest and with excitement. But if you think, no, teaching, I got my teaching diploma because I wanted a job, so now I have a job, I'm getting my salary, I must just show up at school so that I, the principal know I'm at school. Those children must keep quiet and listen to me. I teach, I go home. The, your attitude has to do with the way you think about your teaching profession. If you have a negative attitude towards your teaching profession, it will be demonstrated in the way you teach. So if a teacher thinks teaching is just a half-day job, it's just a job, just to earn a salary. Your approach to your teaching will also be, 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 be negative. If you regard teaching as a calling, a vocation, as something important that allows you to, co to contribute to the community, then you will assume a position of responsibility and you will constantly provide good teaching and uh, the teaching uh, community can in turn expect consistently good teaching from the teacher. What does this mean? You will gain respect. Even in the teaching community, we know who are the good teachers and who are the terrible teachers. Why? It all has to do with attitudes. And what is surprising that I think sometimes teachers underestimate is that learners are watching them and learners know the learners, they know who is a good teacher and who is a terrible teacher. The learners know which subjects they enjoy because of the teacher and which subjects they don't enjoy because of the teacher. And it all boils down to attitudes. The attitude of the teacher can influence whether learners pass or fail. Yes, it is debatable, but that is my stand on it. Your attitude will influence whether learners will be interested in your subject or not. One of the main reasons why teaching is understood to be a profession can be linked to the standards defining good teaching. Teaching, the, 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 the profession of teaching, it's the only profession that has the primary responsibility of passing knowledge from one generation to the other, from one person to the other, and that is a noble calling. But it has standards. It is standards that this is how we do things, this is how we don't do things. And so our attitude should also be shaped by our standards. So defining teaching as a profession. Oftentimes I set a question, why is teaching considered a profession? And many times some students get this question wrong. And it boils down to students not going through the manual. Just to understand, because these are things that you already know as a, as a, a teacher student. You already know these things. And some of you are already in the profession. So this is not something new. It's just a question of putting it on paper. So why is teaching considered a profession? First, remember what we discussed previously, what a profession is. It's an occupation with an elite group with powers and prestige, the members declare in a public way, they declare in the public that they will fulfill certain promises. So what is it that makes teaching a profession? First of all, we say that teachers deserve to be paid for their service. They offer a service to the community and that service deserves to be paid. So as a profession, there's a financial value attached to it. Teachers deserve to be paid for what they do. It's a trade, being a teacher. It's a trade. It's an occupation, just like any other occupation, like being a doctor or being a social worker or being a dentist, whatever occupation you can think of. Teaching is an occupation, and people deserve to be paid for the service they render. So that's one, is that there's a financial value attached to it. Or you can simply say, they get a salary. Secondly, there's a certain level of expertise 
that is anticipated. Because you went to school for a number of years, the community and your fellow teachers expect that you must have a certain level of expertise. You must be an expert in the field of teaching. Why? Because you are trained. So the second thing is that because of your profession, you are expected to have a certain level of expertise, allowing knowledge to be transferred into subject matter that learners understand in which they can give feedback. So you are an expert. So you are expected to have a, level, a certain level of expertise. You are an expert in the field of teaching. So that's the second one that defines teaching as a, as a profession. Like first we said financial value, secondly, level of expertise. Thirdly, learners can depend on the teacher to have up-to-date knowledge and skills, competency in instruction, and to be treated fairly. Professionalism. As a teacher, you are, learners look at you as a model, as someone who has knowledge and skills. Yes, a learner can ask a question and the teacher can say, you know, I am not sure about the answer, can I find out? It's okay. But we expect that you have a certain level of uh, expertise and that learners or your students can depend on you for answers. There is a component of choice. It is a profession because it's something you choose to follow instead of other choices. For example, for you to become a teacher, you had the choice to become a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, any other profession you could have chosen, but you chose to become a teacher. So there's a component of choice when it comes to a profession. You choose what to follow. So that's what defines, this is why it defi uh, teaching is defined as a profession, is because there's a component of choice. In other words, you chose to become a teacher. You made a choice, a conscious choice to become a teacher. So other people can choose other professions, doctors, nurses, what? But you choose to become a teacher. And that is one of the definitions of a profession, is that people choose that profession. Because maybe it's in line with their talents or with their personality or with what they want to accomplish in life. But you chose to be a teacher. That's the fourth key uh, that defines teaching as a profession. Another one, is like, unlike other t uh, professions, teachers do not choose their clients. And this is what, is, uh, what marks a profession. You give service to the community, irrespective of who they are. So your class can be made up of all sorts of learners. You don't choose, I only want to teach boys. No, I only want to teach girls. You get a variety of learners because you do not choose who to teach. And you cannot refuse to teach learners. And that's what defines your profession. It's a profession because it gives service to the community and you do not choose who to give service to and who not to give service to. As long as you are uh, employed by the school, by the Ministry of Education, you get into a classroom, you find the learners there, you teach them and you treat them fairly. Because your profession demands of it. It demands that you teach every client that comes to you that is enrolled within the program and you do not refuse the service. So the learners are assigned to the teachers and they have to accommodate them in the class and teach them as best and as professionally as they can. So what are the ethical behaviors of teachers? All professions have ethical standards. Like I said, ethics refer to the morals, the rights and the wrongs of a profession. So all profession, professions have ethical standards that guide behavior and decision making. So ethics also inform clients about what sort of moral behavior is acceptable in that profession. Ethical behavior is also non-negotiable in the teaching profession. So many times the question uh, for the assignment or for the exam is ask, 
Ethical behavior is non-negotiable in the teaching profession. Explain this statement. And many times students just don't get this question right. First of all, you need to understand what is ethical behavior. We've already explained. It refers to the moral behavior that is acceptable in, that, in, in a certain profession, in this case, teaching. So what does it mean that ethical behavior is non-negotiable? Non-negotiable means you cannot, it's not up for discussion. You cannot argue with the ethical behavior set by the, the profession. So what does that mean? This means that the right and wrong of the profession are not open for change. You cannot enter the profession if ethical behavior says that teachers are not to fight on the school premises. It's wrong for teachers to, to physically attack each other on the school premises. It's just not done. It's unethical. You cannot join the profession and decide this rule must be, must be scrapped. It doesn't work for you then you leave the profession altogether. You either agree with the ethical behavior of the, uh, and standards of the profession, or you leave the profession. The professional ethical standards are not negotiable. They might be implemented differently, but they are not negotiable. You cannot argue and say, but I want to do this. If, 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 if the ethics of the organization says that in our profession, we don't wear clothes that expose our bodies. Miniskirts, for example. You as a teacher cannot join the profession and come to school wearing a mini and decide that it's right. Because the ethical behavior and standards says it's not. Teachers wear, have a dress code that they stick to. So this is what it's meant by ethical behavior is non-negotiable in the teaching profession. The following is therefore expected from teachers. So these are the ethical behaviors expected of teachers. First, teachers must be caring. By virtue of your profession, you need to be caring to learners. And sometimes you find teachers that do not understand this statement, to be caring. That means you must put the best interest of the of the learner, you must teach the learner to pass, but to be caring also means to discipline. Yes, corporal punishment is not allowed in school. And we are, when we talk about discipline, we're not talking about corporal punishment. We're talking about other methods of disciplining learners. So if you care about a learner, you cannot watch a learner misbehave because you know at the end of the day, this will affect their academic performance. So. What are, so you must come up with behaviors that show that you are a caring teacher. And disciplining learners is one of those methods that you show that you care about learners. You must teach to the best of your ability. If you care about learners, you must demonstrate this by teaching learners and making sure that they pass. Because you cannot care about learners and then your learners, 90% of the class fails then it says a lot about your ethical behavior. Secondly, you must set high standards. Um, sometimes teachers don't stretch learners. They don't uh, challenge learners. And you know, in a class, you have learners of different academic abilities. They are very intelligent learners. They are learners that are average. They are above average. They are below average. And they are those that are crying. So you must be able to set high standards for all these learners at their different levels. If you have a very, very intelligent learner, you must be able to accommodate this learner and not just set the standard low because the rest of the class is below average. So this is what it means to set high standards. So you must be able to look at the class and see how many of my learners are above average. How many of them are below average? What can I do to make sure that my learners uh, uh, perform very well in spite of their academic levels? And you, it is possible. Uh, give proper feedbacks. You know, set high standards. Give proper feedback to the learners and encourage them. That's an ethical uh, standard. Provide intellectually challenging learning experience. Yes, this ties in with setting high standards. 
do not just be comfortable with the fact that your learners are below average or they are average. Challenge your learners with new experiences. Come up with new teaching methods. There are many teaching methods. It's not only you standing in front of the class reading from the book. Do group work. Go out into the field, show the learners, demonstrate to the learners. There are so many ways to, 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 to challenge learners. Get an expert in the field to come and talk to your learners. There are so many ways to challenge learners so that they, they have a good learning experience and learning is not just a, a duty for them, but it's a fun experience for them. So you have the ethical obligation to provide learners with a good learning environment and experience. Organize and manage classes and to facilitate learning. Yes, you have to organize your class and manage your class. There must be discipline. Learners must have responsibilities. Your, your class must be presentable. Certain classes, you enter into a class and there are no colors, there are no things on the wall. It's just a chalkboard, a duster, and chalks, tables, and chairs. It's a very dull environment. Go the extra mile, a mile. organize and manage your classes and facilitate learning. See the learners in a very creative way. Arrange your class in a creative way. Organize the learners that they enjoy being in your class. Nurture a learner-centered class culture. It's not a teacher class culture. Not teacher-centered, learner-centered. Let the learner be the focus of your teaching. It's not about you, it's about these new young minds that are being uh, molded. So your class should be learner-centered. So the class must also reflect that it's a learner-centered environment. Continually reflect upon and enhance teaching skills. Like we said, be a lifelong learner. Don't stop learning and always try to improve your teaching methods. Find new ways of teaching your learners from year to year. So the National Professional Standards for Teachers, like we say, the, 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 the teaching profession has standards. So what are standards? Standards are minimum requirements for teachers' practice and conduct. So standards say by the time you qualify to be a teacher, you must have done this and this and that. You must be able to do this and this. Those are the standards. And why do we have standards? Why does the, profession, the, the teaching profession have standards? First of all, to strengthen the quality, effectiveness, and efficiency of the general education and training system. Like we said, teaching is a profession. That means it is an elite group of people with specialized skills. Not anyone can come off the street and claim to be a teacher. You must meet the standards. So why do we have the standards? To make sure that there's quality, effectiveness, and efficiency in the education delivery that we offer service that is of high quality. Because if there are no standards, then anyone can go to school. We don't know if they qualify or not. We give them a degree or a diploma. How will the profession be? It will be very chaotic and very questionable. So the standards are there to make sure that there is quality, there is effectiveness, and there is efficiency in the general education and training system. That teachers who qualify and graduate are equipped to enter the profession of teaching. So standards also protect the profession from imposters and pretenders. So we don't want people graduating and they have no idea what to do as teachers. They don't know how to conduct themselves as teachers. They don't know the theories within the teaching profession. They don't know the skills of teaching, of passing knowledge from one generation to the other. So we don't want pretenders within the, the teaching profession. Um, so it's very important that we have standards. Uh, the standards are guided by the two components, the learning standards and the curricula. 
uh, as well as teaching professional development and incentives. So what is a standard again? A standard is the minimum requirement and the Namibian Qualification Authority, NQA, has developed a national qualification framework to promote a competence-based approach to education and training. Like we said, we don't want all institutions opening up and then saying uh, learners come and study to be a teacher and then the, these people go in the field and they are not qualified. So the NQA has set up standards, a framework to promote competency that when teachers graduate, they are competent and they are equipped to be teachers. It's, uh, it's a starting point, uh, uh, its starting point is the intended outcomes or end pr uh, points of learning. These uh, outcomes are described in documents called standards, which form the building blocks of the NQF. So sometimes people ask, but why is the school strict? Why is IOL strict with us? Why are they marking our assignment like this? Why are we failing? It's because there are standards to be met. And if you don't meet the standards, you don't qualify to be part of that profession. So the NQF, the Namibia Qualification Authority, NQA, sorry, set standards. And those standards must be adhered to. Or the training institution cannot be certified. Standards are the statements of competency that, like we said, we say that it has to do with competency to make sure that teachers are equipped to be teachers and not just have a degree and a diploma to show for it, but also that they have the competency, they have the skills and the knowledge, and they, have the, uh, the, the, they can practice what they were taught. Um, uh, standards do, however, inform learning program developers regarding what the outcomes of learning ought to be, and inform assessors as to what must be assessed and the quality of evidence. Like I said, sometimes students question how they were assessed. Why are we assessed like this? The teacher is too strict. Why is the tutor only concentrating on this and not that? It's because there are standards to be met. So what implications do standards have for me as a teacher? The national standards describe what competent teachers will know and be able to do. So it's very important for you to understand the standards because you need to meet them in order for you to qualify as a teacher. You must meet the standards. Uh, the, the standards also differentiate competency for primary and secondary teachers. What is required of secondary teachers and what is required of primary teachers? Because they teach different age groups, different grades. Differentiate between the competency required for newly qualified teachers and teachers who meet the requirement for licensing as professional teachers. There is a difference what is expected of a teacher that has just graduated. And what is expected of a teacher that has, been, uh, that, ha that has been in the profession? An intern, a student teacher, must meet certain requirements. For you to get your degree or diploma, you must meet certain requirements. The standards then describe the, the competence required to hold a post in teaching and to continue to do so. Uh, so the, the standards are, in fact, the requirements for employment. So if you meet the standards, you get your qualification, and that gives you an opportunity to apply for a job. So it follows then that all teachers must meet the standards. Um, there is a professional code of conduct um, that is important to follow. Um, professional code of conduct. Um, Teaching is reg regarded and regulated as a profession, so there is a code of conduct. A code of conduct simply means there is a code or set standards for how to behave, and that's what we call a code of conduct. So there are set standards, they are stipulated. This is how teachers should behave. And I stop here for now. This is part one of unit one.